Please rise and face the processional cross for our processional hymn, Joy to the World. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved in Christ, at this Christmas tide, let it be our care and delight to hear again the message of the angels, and in heart and mind to go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, and the babe lying in a manger. Therefore, let us read and mark in Holy Scripture the history of the loving purpose of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. But first, let us pray for the needs of the whole world, for peace on earth and goodwill among all his people, for unity and brotherhood within the church he came to build and especially in this city of Ridgecrest. And let us remember in his name the poor and helpless, the cold, the hungry, and the oppressed, the sick and them that mourn, the lonely and the unloved, the aged and the little children, all those who know not the Lord Jesus, or who by sin have grieved his heart of love. Lastly, let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore, and in a greater light, that multitude which no man can number, whose hope was in the Word made flesh, and with whom in the Lord Jesus we are forever one. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven, 
in the words which Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Almighty God bless us with his grace. Christ, give us the joys of everlasting life, and unto the fellowship of the citizens above, may the King of angels bring us all. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson is from Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is from Genesis chapter 22. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. third lesson is from Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore 
The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. fourth lesson is from Isaiah chapter 62. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, 
Build up, build up the highway, clear it of stones. Lift up a signal over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. This is the word of the Lord. The fifth lesson is from Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the same and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, 
and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. The sixth lesson is from Luke chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, 
Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. This is the word of the Lord. seventh lesson is from Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what the time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, 
Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. The eighth lesson is from 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is the word of the Lord.
The ninth lesson is from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the light, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas. Tonight we celebrate the greatest of news, that God has become a man. But to understand the joy of Christmas and all that it means, the comfort that it brings, we have to consider the history of mankind. You have to know the whole story and how bad things have been. And then, and only then, can you understand the joy and comfort of Christmas. 
And things didn't start out so bad. They started out quite well. They started out indeed very well. I'm reminded of a movie in the good old days, 1989. A movie with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Their characters fall in love, they get married, and all is bliss. And then they start to argue. And then they start to really argue, and then they physically abuse each other, and they go through a very messy divorce, and the movie ends quite depressing. And it's a tragic story that could be summed up with the phrase, how, how did things come to this point? It was a blissful romance, and then before you know it, they're trying to murder each other. And those of us who have lived many years, or a few, can testify to the messiness and downright evil of life on this earth. It doesn't take long for child naivete to disappear and the reality of evil and sin smacks you in the face. And the true Christian know, knows why things can be so rotten in this world. He understands how things have gotten so bad. It's all because of our first parents, Adam and Eve. They sinned. They ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the first lesson from Genesis 3 tonight, you don't have it in front of you, but you do have Bibles in your pews. You can always look at those. The first lesson from Genesis 3 tonight takes up the account of God confronting Adam and Eve after they sinned. But look at the text. God is so gentle when he approaches Adam and Eve with this great calamitous sin. And this is the text I want to focus on tonight. And Genesis 3 then is the, the tragic summary, if you will, of the first two chapters. Like the movie I mentioned, it starts out blissful. It starts out wonderful like the perfect romance in a movie. God made Adam in his likeness. God made Eve from Adam's rib. He brought them together in the Garden of Eden. There they were to take care of the garden. It was a perfect place. Beautiful plants, beautiful animals, no death, no disease, no violence. Adam and Eve were perfect. Their environment was perfect. Even their consciences were perfect. And freedom, all oh, the freedom. They were allowed to do anything. Anything. The one prohibition was don't eat from the fruit, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm convinced like Martin Luther, from which we get our, our uh, church's namesake, the Lutheran Church, I'm, I agree with him that this is likely within a day or two of Adam and Eve being created. It, it didn't take them that long to stumble and fall. And within a couple days, the serpent began to talk with Eve and the serpent deceived her, leading her to reject God's word, leading her to believe that God's word can't be trusted, that, you know, if you ate this fruit, you, you, it's going to go well. You're not going to suffer. You're going to be like God. Well, it was all lies. But she fell for it. And she ate the fruit, and she gave some to Adam. He ate it too. Thus sin entered their minds and hearts and bodies and the world itself. And this first sin had serious consequences, pain, suffering, a guilty conscience. Death became commonplace. All these things that had never existed before. It all meant that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden too, barred from paradise and from ever entering it again. And to this day, we have to live with every misery imaginable because of this first sin. But don't simply blame Adam and Eve. You have to realize that you too have fallen prey to the devil's wiles and rejected God's word and committed sin and so made yourself just as guilty as Adam and Eve. 
You've allowed yourself to think that all sorts of sins are worth it. We all fail to fear God as we should, to love Him as we should, to trust Him as we should. We neglect preaching in His Word, thinking that we know everything already. We love being a rebel. We love thinking evil thoughts of our boss at work. We love entertaining in our heads what we'd say to the cops if we get in trouble or the politicians that we can't find ourselves to even pray for. When we're sinned against, we allow ourselves to get angry, get even, and I've just listed the first five commandments. I could go through the next five too, explaining how we make ourselves just as guilty as Adam and Eve. And we do such sins as these and we earn God's wrath and we make trouble for ourselves. And we men, like Adam, deserve to suffer and sweat to get our daily bread. And that burden of having to toil and sweat to make a living never goes away. This was described in our first lesson, Genesis 3. And women deserve to suffer under the authority of men, as Genesis 3 explains. That conflict between men and women aren't, is never going away. It's always there. And Genesis 3 then teaches us, friends, that we are all guilty. We all deserve to die. We all deserve to not even taste or set foot in the Garden of Eden. Now, if this is all there was to Genesis chapter 3, it would be a sad chapter indeed, but here's the good news this Christmas Eve, and it's wonderful, and it's comforting, and it's good news for you and for me, and it's right there in Genesis 3, the promise given in Genesis 3.15, that verse right there. It's the foundation of all the other Old Testament texts that you heard tonight that spoke of the Savior to come, it explains all the New Testament texts that you heard tonight of the Savior who has come in humility and will come again in glory. And here again is verse 15. God speaking to the servant and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's sweet gospel there. There's the message of Christmas there, message of Easter. And so God is saying in that verse that the woman's offspring, one of her descendants, would bruise, or you could translate that, crush the serpent's head, completely undoing him, destroying him. The serpent, of course, is the devil personified. The New Testament calls Satan or the devil the ancient serpent, drawing from this text. But the price of defeating the devil, the price of crushing the serpent's head, would be that this woman's offspring, her descendant, would have his heel be bruised or crushed. The heel is not as important as the head. You can recover from a crushed heel, but you cannot recover from a crushed head. And so we have here a prophecy that a descendant of this woman, Eve, would defeat the devil, the serpent, and undo all the misery that he has brought that we struggle with to this day. Who is this descendant of the woman? Well, the New Testament confirms that this descendant of the woman who would undo the serpent is Jesus Christ our Lord. And he couldn't be any ordinary human being. He had to be God himself. And this is the message of Christmas. God has become a man to defeat the devil for you and for me. How did Christ defeat the devil? How did the devil bruise Jesus' heel? Well, Satan possessed Judas to collaborate with the Jews to have Jesus killed. This was the crushed heel. But then 
Jesus rose from the dead and so defeated death. Now all who believe in the Christ will likewise rise from the dead. And all who believe in thus rise will be able to laugh in our victory over the devil all because of Christ. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated the devil and crushed death. This is the crushed head of Genesis 3. And Jesus' triumph over the devil is all described by the Apostle Paul when he wrote, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross, the cross and the subsequent resurrection. Now, Understand that the Virgin Mary's offspring could only crush the devil's head if he was God himself. It took the Most High God, the greatest spirit, to defeat that old evil foe, the devil. And Jesus' ministry is put in terms of defeating the devil. The Apostle John says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And this brings us again to Christmas. The Savior again, who would crush the serpent's head and undo all the misery that the devil has caused is Jesus Christ our Lord. And he couldn't be a normal human being like one of us. It wouldn't do. If he was a normal man, he couldn't even defeat the devil in one sin, let alone the devil and all the sins of the whole world. And so the baby in the manger had to be human. He had to be our representative to stick up for us and appease God in his wrath, but he had to be fully God to defeat the devil for you. Don't be deceived then with quaint pictures of the baby in the manger. That's the Son of God himself who came to defeat the evil foe for you and for me. That little baby in the manger is not just a sweet story. Oh no. This was God become a man to do or die, battle it out with Satan and Jesus succeeded. He suffered and he died. He allowed his heel to be crushed, but he rose from the dead and so crushed the devil's head. And now death is just a passing fog and all Christians can face death with confidence because of Jesus, knowing that the devil's been triumphed over. Death has been defeated. And this is the message of Christmas. Jesus came to defeat the devil and he did it. And all who repent of their sins and believe in him will likewise snub their nose at the devil when they rise again on the last day. Enjoy Christmas. Enjoy what Jesus has done for you. Amen. We continue with the offering.
Please rise. We continue with the collect and blessing on page 14. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who makes us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as we joyfully receive him for our Redeemer, so we may with sure confidence behold him when he shall come to be our judge, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please remain standing. Here uh, comes the fun part for the kids, at least, with the candles. And uh, I am going to light my candle from the uh, Christmas candle in the middle of the Advent wreath here. And we're going to sing uh, Silent Night. We're going to dim the lights as the um, candles are being lit. And the trick is to hold up your candle wherever Christ is mentioned specifically. And so you'll see they, they are trying to help me out uh, uh, by underlining the part on the hymn that you're supposed to hold up, you see. All right.
thank you for coming. Uh, we'll have someone turn on the lights here in just a second. It's been a great pleasure to have you here for our Christmas Eve service. Uh, in just a moment, you can extinguish your lights and then deposit the candles when you exit in the back. I hope that you would consider joining us again on Sunday mornings throughout the year for divine service where you can hear the good news of Jesus Christ come for you uh, and be refreshed in that. Uh, this ends our lessons and carol service. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.